Welcome everyone. My name is Becca and I work at, with the education team at La Brea Tar Pits. We want to start with acknowledging that the Natural History Museums of LA County are located on and work within the traditional homelands of the indigenous communities that include the Tongva, Tatapiam, Chumash, and neighboring indigenous communities. As a cultural and educational institution, we honor our ongoing connection to these communities, past, present, and future. We are so glad to have you with us this afternoon as we embark on a three-part Ice Age journey to explore the treasures of the vanished world of Ice Age giants and the science of how these treasures connect to our understanding of past ecosystems, current issues of climate change, and all the questions we're still trying to answer. Um, we'll hear from scientists from the Yukon Beringia Interpretive Center and La Brea Tar Pits, two of the world's leading sites for Ice Age fossils as we dig deeper into the Ice Age. To view live closed captions in English and Spanish, please click on the link, the external link that we're dropping into the chat. And for our guests watching on YouTube, the link to the closed captions in English and Spanish is in the video description below. Thank you so much for joining us. And hi everyone, my name is Christy and I'm part of the Yukon Beringi Interpretive Center team. Before I introduce you to the rest of the team, I'd like to acknowledge that the Beringia Center is located in the Yukon within the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Tan Kwachin Council. Also, we respectfully acknowledge the history, customs, and culture of all Yukon First Nations from whom these lands are ancestral home, as well as the Indigenous peoples throughout the Americas with roots in Beringia. Now to introduce you to the team, I'm joined off screen by my Beringia colleagues, Keisha and Lance, who will be helping out behind the scenes. And I've also got our Tar Pits co colleagues, Agnes, Rocio, and Lindsay, who will be helping to organize your questions. Thanks so much, everyone. So before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about what we're going to do with everyone today. We'll be together for about 45 minutes. And first we're going to hear from our scientists, Elizabeth and Laura, and then we're going to take your questions. We'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can and we might have a lot of answers during the presentation, but if we don't get to answer your question today, we want to encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about it on your own. So go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw or write something about that inspires you from the Ice Age. And we all love fan art, so if you have a drawing or picture you'd like to share with us from today's presentation, you can ask your teacher or caregiver to email it to the school programs team, or you can post it to their social media account and tag us, and we'll share that information at the end of today's program. But let's get started. So today we are joined by Elizabeth Hall, Assistant Paleontologist at the Yukon Beringi Interpretive Center. Elizabeth started her career in Yukon Paleontology as a STEP student back in 2003. She works both outdoors collecting fossils all summer long and indoors identifying fossils in the lab during the rest of the year. She doesn't have a favorite part of her job, but she really loves anything to do with fossils. Her favorite fossil is, and will always be, the rather insignificant looking horse metatarsal or foot bone from Thistle Creek, Yukon, which was collected in 2003 and contains one of the world's oldest sequenced genomes at roughly half a million years old. And Laura Tewksbury, is also with us today. She is a senior preparator at the La Brea Tar Pits Project 23. Laura is responsible for excavating fossils, general site management, training and supervising volunteers and students, and sharing her expertise with the public. Her educational background is in both evolutionary biology and American Sign Language interpreting. She loves sharing her enthusiasm for science during her 15 years of working at La Brea Tar Pits in her secondary role as a science communications liaison. So good afternoon, Liz and Laura. We're really excited to be with you today. Good afternoon. So excited to be here. 
So when Liz jumps on, um, I will let you guys take it away from there. If you want to go ahead to the next slide, we can probably start playing this video. Uh, so this is just a video that we wanted to bring in to help give people a concept of where these ice sheets that we may be talking about later are. And uh, Liz put this in, and it's just as a fun video that you can actually see them kind of growing and changing through geological time. And uh, just again, as a point of reference for everybody as to where we are in our different sites, um, we have little markers showing where the uh, Yukon Beringia Center is up in Whitehorse and the La Brea Tar Pits down in Los Angeles. And so again, you're looking at geological time. The markers are in the bottom right corner of this image and just kind of watching those ice sheets growing and changing. Hello, Liz. Hi, sorry, I wasn't able to get on. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a digital world today. We're just sharing this uh, wonderful video that you've shared, which I just get a kick out of. I won't admit how many times I've watched it. Yeah, we just thought we'd start off with this ice breaker. Right, <laughs> break up. So I'm Elizabeth and the Assistant Paleontologist, Yukon Paleontology Program. I'm gonna tell you today about Beringia, which is an area that I work a lot in. So Beringia is the unglaciated area that basically extends from Russia across the Bering Sea into Alaska, into Yukon. So because it wasn't glaciated, it meant that this was an area where animals and vegetation could exist and did exist, fortunately for us. Um, Beringia is kind of divided up into Western Beringia, which is sort of the Eastern part of Russia, and then Eastern Beringia, which is Alaska Yukon. And in the past, during times of glaciation, that Bering Land Bridge is exposed. And actually that Bering Land Bridge is always there. It's been there since the time of the dinosaurs and is still there today. But what happens when there isn't glaci um, glaciation is that all that um, moisture that's trapped on land uh, goes back into the ocean and covers that land bridge. So when that land bridge is exposed, it acts as a migration highway. And so we have animals coming over from Asia into North America, and then we have animals moving from North America into Asia. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit more about two sites that I spend a lot of time in the summer at, and they're located in the Yukon. Um, the heart is where I live in Whitehorse. And if you head further north, um, you're heading towards Dawson City, which is an area that wasn't glaciated. Um, it's an active mining area. We get lots of fossils from there. And then another location is even further north past the Arctic Circle called Old Crow, and that's where that sun is. And it's another location where we get a lot of fossils. So I'm going to turn it over to Laura to tell us more about her location. Thanks, Liz. So hi, I'm Laura, and today I'm representing what most maps refer to as the Librea Tar Pits. I also did want to mention that I'm in the middle of the city, so I apologize for some of the background noise we might get, but we're going to just move through it today. And so yes, if you're looking at the name the Librea Tar Pits, if you translate the Spanish to English, it does translate to the, the Tar Tar Pits. But to the scientific community, our site is known as Rancho Librea. This will come up again later. Our fossils are found in the middle of what is now one of the largest cities in North America. But tens of thousands of years ago, many different animals strolled around what are now the busy streets south of the hills that hold the famous Hollywood sign. As we saw in the picture that Becca shared during the intro to today's program, the drive from the Brea Tar Pits here in Los Angeles, California, and the USA to the Beringia Interpreter Center where Liz is in Whitehorse, Yukon Territory, Canada, is about 2,700 miles or about 4,300 kilometers. For scale, I looked it up. And from here to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC is about eight miles or 13 kilometers closer. You'd think that such a distance would, make that our, would mean that our sites don't have much in common, but happily that's not the case. However, we'll start out by making sure we all know the basics of each site and what makes us each unique. So Liz, we're both considered ice age sites. That's a pretty broad umbrella. Can you explain what sections of geological time you and your colleagues are focused on? So, when we think of Beringia, we really think of the Ice Age, and the Ice Age is essentially the Pleistocene, which is the scientific way of describing that time period. And the Pleistocene is pretty long. It starts at about 2.6 million years ago and goes till about 10,000 years ago. And you can roughly break it up into three parts. You can talk about the early Pleistocene, which is the older bit of the Pleistocene. You can talk about the middle Pleistocene, which is the middle bit of the Pleistocene, 
or you talk about the late Pleistocene, which is obviously the more recent part. And Pleistocene itself actually means most recent. So we're in the most recent part of the geological time scale. Um, here in the middle, there's a this wiggly chart. And um, one of the best ways to think about the Pleistocene is to think about it in terms of glacial versus interglacial. So up to the um, left-hand side where you see all that blue is the time of the glacials. And when you head off to the right-hand side is the time of the interglacial. So it goes from cold and dry to warm and wet, cold and dry to warm and wet. And that's what you will see all throughout the Pleistocene. So when we're in glacial conditions, uh, it means that the vegetation is going to be drier vegetation. So we get things like grasses and sedges. And that means animals who like to eat those kinds of vegetation, they do quite well. So we have a lot of horse, we get a lot of bison, we get a lot of mammoths. But during the interglacial conditions, this is when it starts to get warmer, it's wetter. Uh, the vegetation will change into more shrubby, tree-like environments. So now we have browsers, we have animals like the mastodon or giant ground sloths, peccaries who like to eat um, sort of that woodier vegetation. And you'll see the interglacial cycles and the glacial cycles at both of our sites in the Klondike Goldfields and up in Old Crow. But how we figure out where we are in the Pleistocene is by looking at sort of the stratigraphy. And what we look for um, mostly is uh, tephra. So this is volcanic ash that erupted, fell on the landscape, and we can actually date it. And usually the, the ash is described um, based on the location where it was first described. So obviously the Dawson tephra, which is about 30,000 years, was found first in Dawson. And that means if I find fossils that are above the Dawson tephra, they're younger. If I find fossils below the Dawson tephra, they're older. And I know that I'm in the late Pleistocene at this point. Up in Old Crow, we have the Old Crow tephra, and that's about 140,000 years. And so if I have the Old Crow tephra, I know that I'm in the middle Pleistocene. So Laura, where are you in the Pleistocene? Uh, so while Liz is sometimes looking at things that are millions of years old, here at Rancho La Brea, we're looking at things that are just in that later portion of the Pleistocene. So mostly only tens of thousands of years old. But fortunately for us, that means that most of our fossils are within the window where the carbon-14 radiometric dating method can be used. But we'll talk about that a little more in a bit. But the main reason that our fossils are so young is that where I am right now, in the Los Angeles Basin, was mostly under the sea until about 100,000 years ago. An important thing that our sites share is bison, what some people incorrectly refer to as American buffalo, Buffalo are only distant cousins, but I'll move on. Bison are actually the distinctive species of the time period that we're looking at here, which is referred to as the Rancho La Brea North, North American Land Mammal Age. And yes, as you may have guessed, it's named after our site. Here I also added a photo of modern bison that are still living at our sister institution, the Hart Museum at New Hall, California. And actually, Liz, let's talk about bison at both of our sites a little more. So bison is obviously a mammal that we share in common, an ice age mammal. Bison originally comes over from Asia and makes its way down through Beringia, then down into the States. And up in Old Crow, we have the oldest, most reliably dated bison in North America. And it's about 130,000 years old. And we know that because we had the Daw Dawson, or sorry, the Old Crow tephra, that's about 140,000 years below it. And then just above it, we have this forest bed. So it brackets it between 120,000 to about 140,000. So the bison that we have up in, in Beringia is the steppe bison, which is bison priscus. The second oldest, most reliably dated bison fossil is actually from Colorado, from Snowden, and it's the bison latifrons. So Laura, what kind of bison do you have? So in some of our earlier excavations, we did recover the occasional piece of that bison latifrons that you were talking about, that one that's uh, labeled A on your image that has the very, very long horn cores. But most commonly, we find what's known as bison antiquus. And so bison antiquus is this one I have pictures over on the side, so much taller back, but much shorter horns than you're looking at, at like your step bison. Um, but we do also find many of those same bones, just like that metacarpal, and so, I figured I'd put up a picture since you had one from yours, I put one from ours. And on this image here, so I've had that original brown bracket around the Ranch Labrain. 
And we went ahead and put that blue bracket around the larger time period that you guys are looking at, just to have that larger sense of scale that we're talking about. And uh, if you guys want to learn more about bison specifically, uh, my coworker Sean is going to be doing a fossil finds presentation on that on April 26th. But for now, this is going to tell us more about the types of sediments that preserve the fossils at her site. Okay, so I'm just going to reiterate that um, the two sites that we're talking about is up in the Klondike Goldfields and then the other one is up in Old Crow. So in the Klondike, um, it's actually active mining. So people are still, they, it started in 1898 with the Klondike Gold Rush and but there are um, families still mining there today. And basically they're carving up the landscape, trying to get down to where the gold is. And in the process, they're exposing the sediments. And so when you go out to a mine site in the Klondike, you're seeing fresh ice and it smells. It smells like rotting cabbage and stinky blue cheese. And that's just all the organic stuff that's in the ground. Um, and so we have some of the oldest permafrost actually in the Klondike. There's once again, there's that gold, this is different kind of tephra. It's a gold run tephra. It's about um, 780,000 years old. Um, and because this ground is frozen, we get pretty fresh looking specimens. So there's a horse mandible just over in the top corner there. That's from the Klondike. Um, but the difference between working in the Klondike and working in Old Crow is that when you're heading further north, you would expect that there is more permafrost and there totally is. There's more permafrost up in Old Crow, but the difference is that it's not an active mine site. This is an area that was carved by a river about 11,000 years ago. And so those bluffs have been exposed for 11,000 years. So you really have to dig far into the bluffs to actually see that fresh permafrost. So Laura, why don't you tell us about your site? And uh, so the more we were talking, building this presentation, the more we realized how many commonalities that we had. So here at La Brea, a lot of our fossils are preserved by asphalt is the method of preservation. And what happens is that a lot of classic fossils that you think about, like most dinosaur bones are permineralized fossils where they get chemically turned into rocks, usually by groundwater moving through and replacing those original minerals with other minerals. So it makes a perfect copy um, but with ours, asphalt uh, is actually deep under the ground all across the Los Angeles basin is actually a series of oil fields because again when we were underwater, a lot of that oil was being produced back in the Miocene so tens of millions of years ago, and that oil has been finding an easy path to the surface in this particular area for a long time. And historically it was also mined at our site that's actually part of the reason why fossils were originally discovered here. It was back in the early 1900s. People here mining that asphalt for commercial purposes for paving and roofing and that sort of thing um, ended up coming across bones. And eventually it was figured out that these weren't all modern cows and that sort of thing, that some of these are fossil animals. But that oil gets into all the tiny spaces of those bones. And that's also what gives it that beautiful brown color that we nicknamed La Brea Brown. Um, that's also why you'll see a different color sometimes at our site. Uh, but it's because that crude oil has gotten into it. But of what we're actually digging through, the asphalt is a very, very small percentage of it. Um, it's really just enough to kind of help preserve and hold everything together. Predominantly what we're digging through are silts and sands and clays and gravels. So we're digging through sediment, we're digging through dirt. It's just that it's dirt that has different ratios of asphalt in different places. But even the beautiful fossil deposit behind me it's only about 15% asphalt in that area. It's mostly uh, in that particular area, uh, cobbles and rocks and sands and that sort of thing. So a very different thing, but still tied in with that mining, just like your sites. And I believe next we can just talk about both of them together. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to uh, mention again, so this is that La Brea Brown that I was just talking about. So you can see all the fossils on my side have that brown color to them. Um, and that's because of that oil that's still inside the bones that we want to leave inside of it because it has protected it for tens of thousands of years and will then continue to protect it in our collection. So we leave that color on purpose. So with our, our sites in Beringia, um, because of the permafrost, um, which is basically acting like a giant freezer in time, we get preservation of not only hard tissue like bone, but soft tissue. And so you'll see that we had the wolf pup, sir, 
and our little cute caribou calf beady boo. Um, both of these were found in the same summer and they don't currently look like this. Um, Zer looks a little frostbitten because the miner who found Zer um, thought, well, this is something interesting. He actually thought it was a dog that had fallen down one of those mine shafts that might have been around about 100 years ago. Um, but he thought, well, I'll just stick it in the freezer just in case. So she got a little bit freezer burned. Um, but if you want to see these two specimens, come visit us at the Beringia Center. They're on display here. Um, also, because we have that uh, sort of fresh bone, we are able to get biological information from these specimens. And once again, that's my favorite um, specimen in the collection. I actually have it here with me today, which is that horse metatarsal. It's, it's part of a horse foot. And it's collected in 2003, which is the first year I started as a, a student. And they were able to get um, DNA from it. This was in the sort of early infancy of DNA, where it took quite some time. Um, it took them nearly seven years. And uh, but unfortunately, just about a month ago, um, it's no longer the oldest DNA in the world. That now is mammoth molar, which is about 1.65 million years old. So our fossil horse was about 700,000 years old. So we um, also, when, when you have, uh, when you can't get DNA from specimens, you can actually get, still get proteins from it. So you can sample one bone and match it up with another bone. And that's what this bottom part here with the camels is showing, it's showing this camel that was found up on Ellesmere Island. So that tibia there, that part of the lower lake, um, that's about 3 million years old, but it was pretty fragmented and they wanted to make sure that it was indeed a camel. So we sampled one of our specimens, that camel toe there off to the right, and sure enough, they matched. So Laura, what about your site? Can you get DNA? So- Do you do protein well, analysis? <laughs> So the asphalt preserves very well uh, for things like collagen. So when they're trying to do uh, carbon-14 analysis, what they'll end up doing is drilling a very tiny sample, or at least these days it's a very tiny sample. Uh, back in the day, it used to be a much larger piece that they would have to destroy, but now it's like a sizable pencil eraser. And they'll take that and they'll put it through a series of chemical washes and screens to get all of the asphalt out of it because asphalt's made of carbon, so it would throw off all of that data. And then they're able to convert it into a gas and send it around an accelerated mass spectrometer, which is a fancy way of saying that, you know, just like a big car goes more slowly around a corner than a small car does, they do that, but with uh, tiny, tiny little things and they sort it out and they can figure out how old the particular fossil is. So we have very good collagen for those types of samplings. Um, but so far we haven't uh, had much luck doing ancient DNA analysis on our fossils. But there's a laboratory right now that one of my colleagues is working at where they're trying different ways to get at it to see if they can find a different way to potentially uh, get that uh, asphalt out so that it wouldn't potentially be interacting with what they're trying to look for for the DNA. So maybe soon we'll have more news on that. But until then, uh, I just get jealous of your beautiful, beautiful bunny babies. And go ahead and tell us more about your site now. So um, in this slide, obviously, we're talking about the Klondike Goldfields. And um, this is an area that's been mined since 1898 and is still being mined today. And because of the mining, this is pretty much the reason why we get so many fossils from this area. And so um, the Yukon government works in cooperation with the um, KPMA and the miners, um, along with the First Nation government out there. and. Uh, some of the common finds that we find are things like bison. And so this first um, shot up in the top left-hand corner is actually uh, bison with some soft tissue. So um, we find a lot of bison. Sometimes I call them boring bison because I find them all the time. But this is exciting when you get some soft tissue preservation. Just right below is a picture of Ashling, who actually works at La Brea. She came out one summer and did some field work with us. And I'm hoping when we can travel safely again, that Laura will come up and do some work with us. Um, but she's holding up a leg um, of a horse, which has soft tissue preservation once again. And so that's kind of our second most abundant fossil that we find. Right next to Ashling is me giving uh, Paul or giving Guy Favron a high five, um, because in front of us is like a nearly uh, complete 
mammoth skeleton. Someone was asking if we get mammoths and we definitely get mammoths. We get mainly woolly mammoths, um, especially in the Dawson area. And right beside um, Paul, our guy is uh, Stuart Schmidt. And he's holding something that's not common, but it's pretty cool. This is actually a type of musk ox. It's, it's not the tundra musk ox, it's called a helmeted musk ox. And we call him, him Helmut um, for short. And the, what's so cool about this particular specimen is that he's nearly complete. He has part of the nose, which is commonly not um, articulated with the skull. It gets broken readily. Um, but also where Stuart's hands are is the horn sheath, which is essentially just um, keratin, so it's hair. And it smelt quite strongly for probably two years. And whenever I showed people this particular specimen, I'd always make them smell it because it did smell like that rotting organic smell that I talked about earlier. And just above is Jennifer holding um, a short faced bear humerus. And so we've been collecting more intensely in the gold fields for probably almost 10 years now. Um, myself and another lady, Susan Hewitson, we go out pretty much all summer long. And because we've been doing more intensive collecting, we've actually gotten more carnivores. So this short face bear humorous, pretty cool. Right next to her is uh, Clint Marsters and he's holding up a humorous of a lion, which is the Beringian lion. And it's probably our most common um, a carnivore. And then below is uh, myself with Ben Phillips, who's an aspiring paleontologist, and he does a lot of the collecting for me um, out at Independence. And we're both holding up our favorite bones from this particular find. So the other site that we collect um, intensively out at is up in Old Crow. So Old Crow is kind of, it's different um, because it's not active mining. It's a remote community. We have to fly up to get there. Uh, and when we do field work up in Old Crow, we're basically camping out on the river. Sometimes we do do day trips out of the village itself. It's a pretty tiny village. It's There's about 220 people who live in Old Crow. Um, and we work closely with the Bantak Gwich'in um, out in Old Crow. Every summer we hire um, a student from Old Crow to come work with us. Um, as well as a boat operator. So most of our work is done by boat, um, but it's pretty crazy that the bar that we always um, camp on is called CRH 11A and we call it the supermarket because guaranteed every summer year after year when we go to this particular bar we're going to find tons of bones it's it's insane and we find so many different animals so some of the animals that we found are things like giant beaver we found ground sloth Jefferson's ground sloth um, there's Canadian beaver there's uh, muskrat um, and Clara who is our our summer student one year, she's actually holding up a point, which probably would have been part of an adult adult. So there's um, evidence of human occupation. Uh, right next to the supermarket is another bar that's called Petunia Point. And I'm calling it the corner store because we actually still get a lot of cool things. We got that um, camel of toe that was used in that other study. There's another homotherium um, a humerus right up there. Um, and right across from Old Crow, or sorry, from um, 11A is what I'm calling the pop-up store. It's um, basically a site that we haven't really ever checked out before, even though we've camped right across from it. And this past time that we were up there, we decided to go check it out and there was tons of bones. It was crazy. But we also excavate at the bluffs themselves and um, at the bluffs, it requires a bit more effort, but you're really rewarded. So things like that muskox skull was from the bluff. Um, I'm sitting up there in the middle of that bluff and I'm actually excavating for tiny, tiny microtene teeth. So these are bulls and lemmings. And that's what crazy people do. I don't suggest you do it. If you're smart, you do what Ross McVeigh is doing, which is he's exca excavating for something quite a bit larger, like a mammoth tooth. So. Why don't you tell us a bit more about your site, Laura? Absolutely. So again, in our earlier historic excavations, a lot of the focus was just on the larger fossils, which I understand they're big, they're beautiful, they're very impressive. And at the time, the importance of collecting those smaller fossils wasn't as understood. So even though I will throw a little shade, I also understand the context of it. But again, a lot of that focus is on things like the saber-toothed cats and the dire wolves and uh, larger tools, not as many you know, tiny brushes and dental tools that we're using today, 
um, a lot larger tools carrying sediment in wheelbarrows, as you can see here. And uh, this photo in the bottom corner is actually uh, just after, I believe, two years worth of excavation. This is in one particular room as they're organizing them over in uh, the basement of the Natural History Museum before our museum was built over here to house the fossils. But again, so relatively short period of time they were digging, but still found literally millions probably of fossils once they finished counting everything. But that focuses on those larger fossils. Whereas on the next slide, we can see that uh, with our modern excavations, we have a lot more of a holistic perspective. And I'm sure that the me of 100 years from now will still look at me and judge me for things that I'm missing. But we do our best to get a lot more of the context and so not just the larger beautiful fossils, but also the smaller fossils and the geological context, understanding how these stream channels are coming down off the Santa Monica Mountains and changing our landscape because our story here is oil and water. So understanding how those streams have changed landscape is very important. And uh, so you can see this modern excavation where the main fossil deposit is in the center and very richly asphaltic, but we're keeping all of that material, not just pulling out the largest, fanciest bones. We're keeping some of the things and then even processing the dirt around those larger fossils for smaller fossils, which I have in my picture on the other side here. So there, there are smaller bones of larger animals. So there's you know an ankle bone of a saber-toothed cat. There's also pieces of Western pond turtles and teeth of smaller animals and small bird legs and even things like dermal ossicles. So some of those things that look like rocks are rocks, but some of those things that look like rocks are actually the skin bones of a paramylodon sloth that actually has like built-in chain mail where these tiny little pebbles of bone embedded in their hides. Um, they're related to armadillos, so similar kind of idea, but uh, I love their little dermal ossicles. So that's actually material from this deposit behind me right here. So we have at least one of those particular types of sloth in this particular deposit. Um, but let's see next. Uh, if you want to do a little bit more comparison of our two sites. And so here again, you can see some of the more common animals that I just mentioned. So those dire wolves, uh, this is a particular exhibit we have in our museum that has a sampling of the dire wolves in our collection. So there's only 400 skulls in that particular wall. Um, but again, we are spoiled rotten, I acknowledge that. Um, and then our second most common large animal is the saber-toothed cat that my coworker Sean is holding here. And then uh, in that bottom right, we have a lower jaw of a coyote that he's holding. Um, and again, this is still the same species of coyote that still walks around Los Angeles today. And uh, in our upper right, I went ahead and put some of those smaller fossils that are getting featured right now, which for us are those Neotoma wood rats or pack rats. And uh, I think Liz, that you guys have a similar animal at your site. Yeah, we have, um, so probably our most common um, small mammal would be, especially in the Dawson area is um, the Arctic ground squirrel. And so um, their nests kind of, they're like the paleobotanists, uh, the place of seeing, they'd like to collect a bunch of uh, plants and then they put in their nest. And then we come along later and we can pick it apart and see what plant remains were, um, what they were collecting, what plants lived in the past. Um, another common one, obviously, like I mentioned is the voles and lemmings where that's what crazy people study. Um, our most common actually is um, the bison, and, uh, and then our second most common would be a horse, then uh, mammoth, and this is for the Dawson area. When you go up to Old Crow, um, mammoth becomes more common, and then it's horse, and then bison. Um, our most common uh, carnivore, especially in the Dawson area, is um, the Berenstain lion. And I think up in, in, in Old Crow, it would be probably bear. Beautiful. And so again, I'm excited to hopefully continue to have some more collaborative research between our sites, uh, especially just looking at some of the differences and contrasts because we still have what's known as that carnivore bias in our large animals that I'm pretty sure that Myrene and Grant will get into at, in part three of this talk on April 28th. And then if you want to learn more about the larger stories being told by those smaller fossils, that'll probably be next week in part two on April 21st with uh, Reagan and Grant. But yes, I think now we can go ahead and go to some of our favorite animals. Yay, weird animals. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this isn't my favorite fossil, but this definitely is my favorite ice age animal. And I, I like the saiga antelope 
because they're kind of weird looking, but also because they survived. So they existed in the Ice Age, but they still exist today. So if you want to go see Cygantelope, you have to go to the Russian steppes. Um, but they're, they're adorable, even though they do make it on the ugly animal list quite often because they're weird <sighs> nose. But I think their noses are so cute. I think so And cute. also, I, I realized as soon as we had put this slide together that we were just destined to be friends because our favorite animals are so similar. <laughs> uh, mine is an extinct species, however, and it's a bit smaller. Um, mine is more like LA purse dog size. Um, it could fold up and go in a very oversized purse. And so it's a, a dwarf pronghorn. So it looks very similar to an antelope, but they're actually very, very distantly related. Mine's more closely related to a giraffe than an antelope, but right. uh, still very similar shapes, doing a lot of similar things. And my fossil that I shared is I have uh, the little tippy toe of a baby caprimerix that's on the tip of my finger for scale. So again, uh, they're my favorite animal that we find here. And uh, I just also love that both of our sites have those statues out front of our different institutions where we have a family grouping of mammoths, um, but they are different mammoths. So again, even though it's so similar, it's still different. So ours are Colombian mammoths, which are a bit taller and less hairy, but uh, correct me, what kind of mammoths you have? We have woolly mammoths, which are definitely quite a bit smaller and way hairier. <laughs> well, with those colder temperatures, you probably want it. And uh, so again, but I just love how all of this kind of comes together to remind us that this is why it's so important to use information from different sites when we're trying to understand the past, how it has shaped our present and the clues it gives us about our future. So I look forward to continued partnerships both with this three-part webinar and just future research. And yes, I definitely want to visit. So please have me out there when we can. <laughs> and Becca, I think we have some time for some Q&A now. Yes, we have so many questions. We've got a lot of people here with, they're just buzzing with curiosity. We might go a little bit over if that's okay, just a couple minutes, just to get as many questions as we can. Um, let's see, um, okay, sorry. We have so many questions, it's, it's uh, I'm gonna pull them all in together here. Um, Laura, we had one question. Um, Juan was wondering if there's a difference between tar and asphalt, and Jackson was wondering if when you're talking about asphalt, if you mean that's the same stuff that's used on the street. So asphalt and tar, when we're just using the words are very commonly used to mean the same thing. But what we have here, even though it's even called tar in our name of the tar pits, it is technically asphalt. Tar is a man-made byproduct of burning things like pine pitch or coal. And uh, they're used for very similar purposes, things like waterproofing and that sort of thing. But asphalt is the crudest form of naturally occurring oil. So it's coming here from underground, from these oil fields underneath us. Uh, but it is the same kind of thing that is then refined in other places and purified and mixed with very particular ratios of gravels and sands to make the same asphalt they use for paving and for roofing, that sort of thing. Very cool, thank you. I think, Christy, do we have a question for Liz? Yeah, actually, we have a great question for Liz as well. Um, Liz, some people were wondering, um, specifically Olivia, if um, our wolf pup, Zur, is a dire wolf or a different kind of wolf, and maybe what is the difference? Well, um, our wolf pup is a gray wolf, and so it's, it's the wolf species that you would find here today. Um, it's, it's not a dire wolf. We never got dire wolves up here. They're, and uh, maybe Laura can talk a little bit more about dire wolves because it, it turns out, I mean, it was always assumed that they were just related to gray wolves, but it appears they might actually not be related. They might be a different genus altogether. Yeah, which is kind of exciting though, because uh, the dog family tree is always very complicated. So I'm interested to see uh, how our understanding of dire wolves continues to build but it's definitely one of those things where uh, we definitely, I'll just pretend that we hoarded all the dire wolves. We do have some gray wolves as well, but they tend to be very rare in our collection. So I love seeing yours. That's so cool. Uh, we have a couple questions for both of you. Um, Aileen is wondering, how do the fossils feel? And I'm curious for both of you, if, if, if you've been able to feel fossils from other places, if they feel the same, based on their preserve, you know, the sediment that's preserving them, or maybe if that affects how they feel? 
Oh yeah, for certain. Yeah, they can feel, you know, if, if it's in something that's uh, a more acidic, like a, a lime sort of softer, that can change the outside of the bone. So it can feel more powdery for certain. This is, this is my favorite. Awesome. This one feels pretty good. Yeah, see. Um, and then, oh, yeah, and ahead. I have just, uh, so a smaller fossil for me, but I have a terminal tarsal phalanx or the bony part of the bird claw that I'm going to try to find enough lighting for. There we are. And uh, this one is from one of the other boxes, but this one's about 42,000 years old and is very kind of classic La Brea fossil for us. So chemically, it's still pretty much bone. So it feels very much like bone. Uh, it has that smoothness to it. We don't lose a lot of that in our particular fossils. Um, our insects are still, they look like insects, uh, still feel like insects. Uh, mm -hmm. Freshwater snail shells still have their ridges on the outside edges, that sort of thing. Um, but I have felt fossils from other sites and especially depending on, and even at our site sometimes with some of our fossils that do have more of that permineralization that started to happen before the asphalt came in and joined the party. And uh, so the just, for me, it's more of a difference in weight rather than texture usually, because our fossils tend to be so smooth, relatively speaking. That's so cool. Thank you so much. Chris, do we yeah. have another question? Yeah, I do actually. It's a, it's a bit of a follow-up question and, and this can be for both Liz and Laura. Um, Caitlin is wondering, you know, how easy is it to break the fossils? Like you kind of mentioned their texture, but when you're excavating, do they break easily or not usually? Um, it, it can depend on sort of what environment they're in. So if it's, it's in like, let's say it's stuck in the permafrost, I'm out in the Klondike where uh, you can definitely see that on ice. Um, it's hard to extract it. I need to really just use some water to um, thaw that ice. It's the best way to do it. But if I was trying to yank it out of the section, I could damage that substance. So I, I just, I, I wait. But I do have a cautionary tale. Um, we we do have dinosaurs in the Yukon. We did in the past, but we don't have a lot of dinosaur bones. And the one that we do have is um, is part of a hatch sleep, part of a, a femur, or sorry, sorry, a radius. And I took it to a kindergarten class. And I, I liked, you know, for kids to feel the bones. I think it's important to, you know, you touch the bone, you're connecting with the past. And it was probably the third student who took the bone and broke it where you can. So they can break. Like I said, I repaired it. It doesn't look broken anymore. But <laughs> be careful. Oh, goodness. It's very sad. But yes, uh, we also, uh, when we do have in person events again, uh, we have a couple of our fossils that are set aside. But usually we will make sure to, um, some of them are just literally attached to a block of wood with some wires to try to keep them stabilized. But even that, sometimes we'll have to use a consolidant or a very thin glue just to kind of help give it extra protection. Um, but the fossils that I'm working on here, when we're digging amongst where it's an area that we know that there are lots of fossils, we use a chemical solvent to kind of reconstitute that sediment a little bit, like give it a little bit more wiggle room, turn it back into a really sticky, gooey, browny kind of texture. And then, but part of the reason why we don't break as many things is that when we're digging in there, we're using usually dental picks. So just slowly, carefully, grain by grain, excavating those. Uh, but the other reason that uh, it's slightly easier for us in many of those ways is that uh, our timetable that we're working on is very different. I originally started Project 23 that was going to be a five-year project, and that was starting in 2008. So uh, things sometimes take a little bit longer, um, but that's part of the, the trade-off for being more um, uh, careful around the fragile things. But so for our fossils, at least, they're both as strong and as weak as bones usually. So a lot of it is just kind of slowly, carefully taking the time to get it untangled from all of the other fossils, because again, we're spoiled rotten. Um, but uh, most of our fossils are pretty sturdy. Every once in a while, we'll get things that for unique reasons aren't as stable, and we'll just all make sure to tell each other and be like, hey, be careful when you're working on that one thing. Um, and every once in a while, we'll have to use a glue when we're out in the field just to help keep it sturdy until it gets to our laboratory where they can finish make sure it's uh, very sturdy and stable. But usually don't break things as often as you think, but part of that is that we're able to go slowly and carefully. It also depends what part of the body it is too. Like the, the um, skulls tend to be more fragile because the bones tend to be quite thin and there tends to be big holes in the skull. So you, you try to be a little more cautious with them. 
Whereas the long bones are they're denser, so you don't have to worry as much about them. Absolutely. Thanks. That's so interesting. So I think basically, if you find a fossil, you just want to be careful, even if it is maybe strong. Yeah. Just to be oh. safe. <laughs> it's been um, there for a very long time. Might as well take the time to exactly. keep protecting it. Absolutely. Yes. I think that's the right course of action. Um, Christy, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. And I have one that I'd like to post for both you, Liz and Laura. Um, where is it? Oh, Carolina and Ellie are wondering, why did you both choose to study the Ice Age? And there was another question here from Carolina. I'm just wondering, how did you find an interest to become a paleontologist? Or maybe what was it that interested you? Do you want to go? Okay, I'll go first. Uh, we're both like, oh, you guys. Uh, so for me, I was one of those classic kids that at age four was like, hey, parents, I want to be a paleontologist. And they were like, you and every other four-year-old around you, but okay. And I just never really grew out of it and uh, do appreciate them for all the support that they gave me and just kind of encouraging me and my STEM career and giving me resources and driving me to volunteering at all sorts of different uh, fossil sites. And it wasn't until I actually started volunteering here back in 2006 that, uh, that my parents would drive me 75 miles each way to come volunteer here once a week. So thank you to them. Um, but it was one of those things where that's where I finally was like, oh, I've dug on lots of fossils and I loved them all, but this, this is what feels like home to me. And so I volunteered for two years. And then when the temporary staff position opened up for Project 23, I said, yes, please. And then I've been here ever since. And my story is pretty similar. I was, um, I used to live in Calgary, which is, you know, there's lots of dinosaurs there. And I wanted to be a paleontologist when I was five years old. And, uh, how I got into the Ice Ages is basically we moved up to Whitehorse and when I rediscovered that I wanted to be a paleontologist well there was the Ice Age all around me so that's where my I still like dinosaurs I, I still get into dinosaurs Kristen did you have one more question for us or? Oh, yeah sure I can do one more um I was actually wondering, and um, Shri put this question online, is what do you guys do with the fossils after you find them? So after you um, take them out of the field, maybe just a quick summary, I'm sure it's kind of the same in both locations, but maybe not. Yeah, so um, ours, when they come out of the field, especially in the Klondike, they're wet. And so we bring them back to our field camp and we have um, a shelter where we dry them out for a couple of days. And then because they're just coming out of this sort of mucky, wet um, sediment, so it's really loose, it's really easy just to take a brush and we brush off the sediment. And then, then we repack them and then we bring them down to Whitehorse where our main lab is. And then when we unpack this, the fossils once again, then we do another quick clean of them and then they're pretty much ready to go. And then they get cataloged and they get stored in facilities here in Whitehorse. And then for us, uh, we're very spoiled in that we are a site specific institution. So because we're in the middle of the city already, uh, we were able to eventually uh, build a museum here on site. So after I finish digging a fossil, I can literally just walk it over. Uh, so I'll make sure to keep all of its data intact, put it into a container that has all of that information to keep all of that context preserved. But then I can just take it uh, to our laboratory inside the museum. I can just walk it over and uh, we have a lot of backlog over there, but depending on the current research priorities, our lab staff inside will then go ahead and pull whatever needs to be pulled and use a series of uh, chemical washes and mechanical uh, small tools to clean the exterior surfaces so that everything is still visible when a researcher wants to look at it, but uh, keeping the fossils as protected as possible uh, when it's in our collection. Because again, it's one of those things where we have millions of fossils, so we need to make sure that everything is very accessible and also organized. So there's a, a, a large team of people that I work with to make that happen. There's altogether too many fossils for me to manage all of that. Yes, I can vouch for that, Laura. We have millions and millions of fossils at the tar pits. Um, well, thank you both so much for joining us and for answering so many of these questions. Um, I know we didn't get to all of them and I'm sorry about that, but if we didn't, please write it down. You can send it to us in an email. We'll try to answer it. Or you can do some research on your own. You can visit the Beringia Center's website and the Tar Pits website for some more information. And I'm going to share my screen so you can see 
our social media handles. If you do have any um, fan art that you'd like to share, feel free to do that. Christy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all of our friends and our students for joining us this morning. And thank you, Laura and Liz, that was great. We learned so much um, about fossils that are found both in the Yukon and Los Angeles. So if you wanna learn more about the Yukon Burundi Interpretive Center, please feel free to add us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram at Yukon Beringia. Yeah, and you can also follow our other fossil preparators like Laura at La Brea Tar Pits on Instagram. The handle is at the La Brea Tar Pits. And we'll also have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. And you can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash the La Brea Tar Pits. And thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you again next week on April 21st at 1 p.m. for our second episode of uh, From the Yukon to the Tar Pits as we learn more about studying how studying fossils helps us to understand climate change. And for those of you joining us on Zoom, we've got one more question to ask all of you. And thank you all again. We'll see you next week.